Today's guest has been featured in Bravo, CNN Headline News, MSNBC, OWN, and Top Doctors. It is an incredible honor to have Dr. Stephanie Bathurst here with us on the show. We have saved this episode for Valentine's Day week because we feel that it's incredibly important to have someone as well-versed in intimacy and the topics of relationships. Dr. Stephanie is a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist and certified sexologist. She is also licensed in Maryland, Hawaii, and Florida, Virginia. I can't wait to really be able to jump into this conversation with you. But before, let's chat a little bit. So on with the show. Welcome to Casa de Confidence, a podcast for you. You'll hear some incredible women and some awesome cool dudes going confidently in the direction of their dreams and living in the purpose of their heart. You're our host, Julie DeLuca Collins, and you are our sidekick, hashtag handsome hot husband, that again, and the producer of the show, that I am. I am an author, speaker, coach, dreamer, and most of all, we help people go in the direction of their dreams and support them on their purpose. So pull up a chair, grab a drink, and make yourself at home because our casa is your casa. Hey, Julie. Daniel Collins. Hello. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another week of Casa to Confidence. And we are once again late. We are once again late. You know, it's been a busy couple of weeks. You For someone what? who batches episodes, I can't believe that we still are late. I know. But my priorities? Yes. Are my customers. Your customers or your wife? What <laughs> would our guest say about that? Well, <laughs> it's not my wife. It's our podcast is what you always tell me. Oh, yeah, it's true. It's our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> right. Oh, anyway, amazing. Yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks, but you know what? Busy, Neither here nor there. Busy is. I'm looking forward to this episode, especially on a week like this. This is a week of Valentine's. And yeah. Did you get me a gift yet? No. I just want to tell you. Did that you get me a gift yet? Of course. Really? There, yeah. It is Valentine's Day on Wednesday. Tomorrow, Wednesday. there's going to be snow. Oh, I guess I'm going to be late then. <laughs> Just like this podcast. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Anyhow, I have to laugh at something that happened to us last week. Okay. Um, I'm we scared. Ha- so we have a client, and we were on, on a Zoom call with this client. He's a <laughs> podcast client. And yeah. it's it's a male. It's our male podcast client, our cool dude. And yep. he he was saying, he's like, I think I know both of you. And he described Dan to a T, and he described me to a T. Except when he described Dan, he said, that's Julie. And, you know, because he called Dan chatty and he called me when he was describing Dan. He said, and you're very methodical. Actually, he, you know, so he got us kind of turned around. He got us 180 degrees out. But yes, he caught me at a moment where I had been, you know, (laughs) I had been working a lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when I'm working a lot and getting things done, I will get chatty. Yes. You know, it's going to get chatty. And I'll speak a little faster. And yeah. I guess I was being Julie. <laughs> Julie being was being Ju- me because I was actually putting my head up. Like, hold on. <laughs> he didn't <laughs> want to let me talk at well, all. It's not. No, I was not silencing you. You weren't silencing I me because I mission. will not be silenced. <laughs> I, I, I had a couple <laughs> things I needed to to work out in, in my process. In your brain. In the, No, in my process of editing um, the podcast for... For um, for this customer, you know, we should anyway, we should give him podcast. we should give him a props. I mean, Absolutely. if we're talking about his show, we might as well yep. give Trace Trace um, Hobson. That's right, and Trace Hobson has an incredible podcast, and it's called it's called Safe Space Made Simple. There you go. It's a great show, and it's worth the search. Go into your little machine that you hold in your hand, the telephone thing, a jig. Go in and take your fingers. Push those digits, go into your podcast app, and safe, space, made, simple. Take mm-hmm. a listen. It's really good. It's really good. And by the way, it is a safe space for nurturing excellence in healthcare leadership. So if you want to check it out, I highly recommend it. Yes. But now, back to our podcast, Casa de Confidence. <laughs> <laughs> you really wanted to say back to me, didn't you? 
I did want to say back to me. <laughs> you know me well, don't you? Julie, Julie, you're nothing but predictable. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, you know, did you predict that I would uh, marry you someday? No. <laughs> Oh, no, I no. didn't think I would ever have the honor. The honor. Mm. Now you're really trying to, you know, please me. It's not that kind of show. It's not that kind of show. I want to tell you that I am so relaxed. We went with girlfriends with my girlfriend, Arlene and Johanna and Ellen <laughs> to the the water's edge. Oh, yeah. Hotel and spa it sounds for like a girls' a great, weekend. Yeah, it sounds like you had a great time. We had a great time. Mm-hmm. I think everybody needs to get some time with their girlfriends. Mm-hmm. That's or true. with their boyfriends. Like yeah. boyfriends, not boyfriends. Or if boyfriends, if that's your boyfriends. Wow. You're all <laughs> hung up on titles right now. I bit my lip, okay? <sighs> that's the truth. I bit my lip. It hurts. <laughs> and every time I speak, it's like, boom, it hurts me. Mm. Um. You know, we we actually had a first at Casa de Collins yesterday, though. Ooh, we did? Yeah. What you did we didn't, have? You didn't even notice, did you? No. Well, maybe <sighs> I did. You got to tell me what it is. Hmm. Uh, we were rooting for the same sports team last night. We were rooting for the same sports team. You're right. It's the first time this happens. Mm, yeah, and we, we our, lost, though. Yeah. Our, well, you <laughs> fell asleep before you noticed that they lost. Well, I didn't care enough. <laughs> to stay awake and to be to work early seriously what Mm. it's you know what i used to take back in the day Mm -hmm. i used to take every super bowl monday off wow that was your holiday huh it was my holiday because you know the patriots were always in the super bowl so i always needed that day off (laughs) (laughs) oh my goodness i got cocky there for a second you did you You know the dynasty's over and a new one has risen Mm. the new dynasty being the uh the chiefs the Chiefs is they a new are, dynasty. They are correct. officially a dynasty. Three Super Bowls. Three Super Bowls. So, anyway, for those <laughs> people in football land. Yeah, what did you think of the halftime show? Well, you know, I liked it. But, you know, I think uh, it was a little flat in spots. Okay. I think I think Little Wayne, he 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 woke everybody up. And did you see when Little Wayne came out? Mm-hmm. If you look in the background, yes. this everyone's dancing, the crowd, the they're pulsating. Yep. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed. I I, lo- I saw a video where there there's two people they are getting thrown in the air out of the crowd. Oh my god! <laughs> they're I like did not thrown, see that. like twenty feet in the air. I did not caught. see that. <laughs> it's probably the best part is these people get thrown up in the air. By the way, what you was know, your I, favorite commercial? My favorite commercial. I have one. In, I have a favorite commercial. Okay, I I think I know what your favorite commercial is. <laughs> Tell me what my favorite commercial is. Your favorite commercial was the one of like. That dude with the Wolverine and the other guy. Wolverine and the other guy? I forget what his name is. Deadpool. Oh, Deadpool. Was that your favorite commercial? It was not. Was it the Dunk Kings? The Dunk Kings. <laughs> yes. Ben Affleck. That was trying fun. to record. <laughs> it's, are they married or are they just They're together? married. Yeah, yeah. Back in their, <laughs> in their studio. <laughs> and uh, his buddy was not having it. You mean Ben Affleck? Ben no. Affleck. I mean Matt Damon. Uh, Matt oh Damon my goodness, I'm getting was old. not having it. And at the end, she's like, "Y'all gotta get out of here." And she goes, "Oh, Tom, you can stay." <laughs> Tom Brady. Mm. <laughs> it was very funny. I thought <clears throat> well, that was hilarious. It, it and is I very went funny. to Dunkin' Donuts this morning, and that yeah. was playing on their sh- on their menu screen. <laughs> yeah. What a great opportunity to repurpose content. I know, right? Which is what we do. Well, apparently dun- the Dunkings do too. The Dunkings. I wonder if they're going to come out with um. There was a follow-up commercial later. There was. Now I'm going to have to go. Ben Google Affleck that. and um, his buddy there. I forgot his name again. Matt Damon. Yeah. Matt Damon. What's wrong with my brain? They're walking down the street and they look at each other. You, you think they'll ever let us back in Boston again? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh my goodness. Well, I um, I think that overall it was a really great game. I did want San Francisco to win because Mm. I have family in San Francisco. I left my heart in San Francisco. It is a wonderful place to visit. But again, we have a new dynasty and I appreciate when people work hard and reach a success for what they're working on. And sports is always the the best when you got a villain. Mm -hmm. It sure is. You have the Yankees. (laughs) Yankees are not villains. Chile. They're champions. You have the <laughs> <laughs> you have the Yankees. You have the 
you had the the Bulls, you had the um, Patriots, mm-hmm. and you get the Chiefs. You always hate the people. I mean, people in sports. You always, if someone wins too much, you want someone to knock them off their horse. Mm. That's the way it is. Yeah. Hey, by the way, I have excellent news for us. Yes. It is. Remember when the Starbucks opened in our town? It was the best thing that happened to this town prior to me moving here. <laughs> okay. Guess who is moving to the to that thing? The the where Starbucks is? No. It's the shops at Eastview. Apparently, that's what those shops are called. I don't know. Uh, okay. You know the plaza where Planet Fitness is in no. the nail salon? Nope. It's right by our house. We can walk there. Oh, yeah. Okay. That yeah. plaza. Okay. Who's going there? Okay. Another Starbucks? No. The Fresh Monkey. What's a Fresh Monkey? What do you mean? You don't know what the Fresh Monkey is? A, fre- a monkey that is just a wise guy? Listen, I am super excited about this because I'm going to walk there. <laughs> right. I'm going to walk to the Fresh Monkey and What's get my monkey? smoothies. Oh, it's a smoothie shop. It is a smoothie shop. Okay. So freaking fun. I can't wait. Is it a fresh monkey because they make banana smoothies? They Well, they, they have a monkey with a banana and other fruit. <laughs> <laughs> the logo. Oh, my God. It's so stereotypical. He's got a banana. But it's fresh, you know? Okay. And I, I can't wait. I'm, I'm very excited because, you know, we need new businesses opening up in our town. Okay. So... I'm going to tell you, I want to get back a little bit into our amazing guest, Dr. Stephanie. Um, She is incredible. She's doing some work that a lot of people in relationship counseling and relationship work may not necessarily delve into. Some of the things that we talked about are definitely a little bit sensitive. So if you have sensitive ears, listen on your headset, or if you yourself had tender sensibilities, uh, listen accordingly, because we do talk about her journey to becoming a therapist, how intimacy and delicate intricacies and in, uh, how intricacies and intimacy can mm. create deeper connection. Mm-hmm. And also we explore awareness, change, forgiveness, lots of different insight. But we also delve into a practice, an area of Dr. Stephanie Bather's practice that includes ethical non-monogamy explored. That's for the curious about or living alternative lifestyles. So our conversation can take a little bit of a turn, but I did want to touch on that. I would not do justice to who she is and what she is doing in this world if we weren't talking about that. But we also unpacked that she hosts several couples retreats. Oh, she has couples (laughs) retreats at Oahu, Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm excited because it sounds like this is an amazing experience. She integrates functional medicine component in the retreat and aromatherapy along with some deep topic for intimate relationships. So I will let you go check it out and go to her website to know what we're talking about. Hmm, cool. Check it out, guys. Check it out for sure. Now, um, tomorrow we have some snow. You're staying home. I'm excited that you're here. Yeah, I'm going to be here tomorrow. Uh, you're gonna I mean, s- we're making this episode not very uh, evergreen by talking about snow tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but the yeah, producer of the show has to come in. With yeah, this whatever. Sometime. You know what? Tomorrow, I'm staying home. You know, it's on a this snow day, day in 2024, I'm going to stay home because... It's a snow day. It's a snow day. It's a snow day in Connecticut. <laughs> so excited. Anyhow, listen, I want people to go and check out our incredible friend, Dr. Stephanie Bathurst. And to check out her website, BathurstFamilyTherapy.com. And also follow her on all of the social media channels because she has some incredible content that she is sharing with the world. Again, she has been featured in some wonderful publications. And I highly encourage you to listen to some of these other interviews after you listen to our show. All right. So here we are on with the show with Julie and Dr. Stephanie Bathurst. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode. Today with me, I have Dr. Stephanie Bathurst, and I am incredibly honored that she's joining us. She is coming to us live from Hawaii, and she is a licensed clinical marriage and family therapist. She started in Maryland, now she's in Hawaii. But really, I want to be able to talk to her a little bit about what she is doing because she has earned a doctoral degree in clinical sexology at the International Institute for Clinical Sex 
Sexology in Miami, Florida, and she holds a master's degree in marriage and therapy, marriage and family therapy with a specialty in addiction counseling. Um, Again, I am incredibly grateful that she is here because we have so much to unpack. But as with anything, let's find out a little bit more about her. Welcome, Dr. Stephanie. I'm so happy that you're here with us. Thank you, Julie. I'm really excited to be here too. And I think there's so many conversations we could get into today. So I'm excited. Well, I, I am excited. And, you know, my husband walked away because he's like, oh, I don't want to be involved and be roped into this. Uh, isn't it interesting that, you know, we are so fascinated as women to continue to do personal development. And at times it's really hard to kind of get the guys to be into personal development as well. Is that a norm or is it just my experience that from what I've seen? Yeah, yeah. I think it's human nature to to feel uncomfortable with any kind of change. Mm. We have this natural like resistance to anything that's unfamiliar. And um, I think once you get past those initial like discomfort experiences, you feel empowered to continue to grow, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just like those first few milestones where you start to disempower that discomfort and feel enlivened by the change. Mm, I I love that you're saying that, you know, discomfort is what I have learned is the currency I have to pay for my dreams. So if I want to live my life uh, in a more full way, I know that it's going to require that discomfort and is going to require me stepping out of the norm and to go into the unknown. And, but again, I revert back to that comfort zone because I'm human, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I, I think it's, um, it's very empowering to feel like confident in yourself mm-hmm. and in your future self to be able to manage difficult moments and, yeah. and allow like allow your growth process to not be dictated by emotion all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I love that. Yeah, thank you. But I'm curious, you have an impressive background. You're doing some wonderful work, but what got you here? I Did you sit in second grade and say, I want to be a sexologist and marriage therapist? Or how did you get here? I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Um, so I've always known that I wanted to be a therapist. I okay. don't, don't have memory of like the exact moment when I made that decision, but I do have a sixth grade yearbook where my bio mm. says that I want to be a therapist. So I know it was really young um, that I recognized I wanted to help people. And I think as I continued on with mm-hmm. my educational journey mm-hmm. and got more and more specialized with my like interests and passions, it became more focused into the niche of couples therapy, right? Mm-hmm. Like connection, vulnerability, intimacy, love, like these are basic human needs that yeah. we all um, th- we all need for, for, um, for fulfillment purposes, for quality of life. And I mm-hmm. think there was a, a very significant need for uh, sexual intimacy coaching and support, at least not from, that wasn't something that I experienced um, pretty heavily in my own education. And I had a lot of it. Uh, So I had, when I transitioned, got my uh, degrees and transitioned from my master's program, I was working predominantly with couples relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think because of my like general openness and my philosophies about relationships, I started to find a lot of uh, like sexually explorative or non-monogamous coupledoms seeking me out, which was interesting because that wasn't something I was marketing. But I think in working with that community so <laughs> heavily and, and being open and receptive to whatever style of relationship works best for them, um, I started to specialize just naturally and organically in ethical non-monogamy and alternative lifestyles. Mm-hmm. And that kind of drove me to want to get a PhD so that I could be the most competent professional and provider for these clients. So Amazing. that was the that was the evolution of my um, of my degrees. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that because you know you're definitely working with a population that a lot of people don't talk about, right? And you you certainly are not the first a marriage therapist and counselor that has come to the show. You're not the first person who works with couples in the sexo- as a sexologist or individual working in this realm. But now we're digging a little deeper. And by the way. The business coach in me loves that you niche down. 
<laughs> you have to, right? You yeah. have to. And again, that is one of those uncomfortable things and hard things for us that are like, well, well, what I can work with everyone, but then we really start speaking to no one when we're trying to talk to someone. So I do like that a lot. But you're working with individuals of all sexes and genders and multi-partner relationships. What does that mean? So if someone is listening and they are, you know, in their kitchen and then just all of a sudden, I, they're like, what did I hear? Break this down for us, because I think that this is going to be an educational show. And by the way, if you have little ears around you, please, this might be something that you need headphones for and uh, you want to make sure. It, and we will put also a warning at the beginning when Dan and I have our little intro to this. But yeah, tell me more. Unpack that for us. Yeah. So being a board certified clinical sexologist, um, it is pretty expansive within mm -hmm. sexual expression and intimacy needs. So I see clients with pelvic floor dysfunctions that are impacting their ability to be intimate with their partner or really mm -hmm. just feel good in their own bodies. Mm -hmm. um, so helping create conditioning programs for them. Uh, I treat, I naturally and holistically treat uh, low libido or incompatible libidos between partners, mm -hmm. as well as any kind of erectile dysfunction or pelvic pain disorders that are negatively impacting sexual experience. Um, yeah, I also assist with trauma recovery, sexual trauma recovery, um, and help them reprocess and mm -hmm. be able to move forward without that weight and heaviness on their shoulders. Right. And generally just integrate sexological techniques and recommendations for intimacy and connection and vulnerability, which are naturally secondary symptoms that are often impacted when there's a betrayal or a resentment mm -hmm. that has gone unrepaired in relationships. So even when I see a coupledom for more like traditional couples therapy issues, we mm -hmm. eventually transition and slide into sexology because they're intertwined, right? Mm -hmm. Intimacy is intimacy. So when we yeah. feel these protective barriers around us from a pain moment of the past, mm -hmm. it impacts our sexual desire, arousal, ability to connect with somebody else or hear them in mm -hmm. their request. So I think it's all like interwoven, right? As human oh, beings. Oh, 100%. You know, I um, I have, for better or worse, I think um, I come into my, my current marriage with the past experiences of my first marriage. And sure. certainly my first marriage was um, not, I, how do, how should I say this? I want to protect the innocent, I guess, uh, because it's not just my story to share, but yeah, I, I was definitely not sexually well matched and it's no secret or, or maybe it is to some people, but I, you know, my first husband, after spending a lot of time wondering what was wrong with me, I, I found my first husband was gay. And it was like, oh, I get it. Okay, it's not me, it's you. And it was certainly something that really created a lot of um, angst in me. Um, and, and it brought up a lot of my shame issues. Thankfully, you know, I have an incredibly loving partner who um, now the, the relationship is very different, right? But by far not perfect. Um, how do we use the experiences from the past into creating the present that really makes us continue to be connected and really focus on being uh, equal give and take. I, I, you know, I guess I'm, I don't, I'm not sure what I'm saying, but maybe you can take what I'm saying and, and talk to us more. Yeah, no, I love all of that. Uh, so what you're talking about is finding deepened meaning from a yeah. moment, right? Yeah. It's a critical and final step to the forgiveness process, right? Mm -hmm. In the clinical field, forgiveness does not mean um, like forgiving someone else and allowing them to feel relief from the choices mm -hmm. or actions that they took. Forgiveness is about us, right? It's about our yeah. own quality of life and us deserving something more fulfilling or healthier than carrying the backpack of past pain moments around mm -hmm. all the time, right? Yeah. So finding deepened meaning in a past pain moment or a past wound is so super critical because it allows our brain to one, compartmentalize the past from the present, right? Mm -hmm. Like visibly, observably, objectively now is different from then. I no longer need to carry that kind of 
intensity, hyper arousal, mm-hmm. hyper vigilance, anticipating right. another pain moment if they're if they're visibly different, right? Right, right. And it also allows us um, to grow, right? I think mm-hmm. there there needs to be if we're if we're reflecting on the past because the past is forever solidified, we can't change it. Yeah. There should be something constructive about that reflect reflection. We want to gain something from it rather than it just be like a passive consumption of our time and gotcha. energy, right? Yeah. So that deepened meaning is like, okay, that was a really crappy time in my life. That was really <laughs> heavy. And I can empathize with my past self and how difficult that moment was. And also, I want to make sure that I went through all of that mm-hmm. for a purpose, for a meaning. What can I take away? What life lessons can I learn? How can I learn to better articulate my needs or boundaries to have mm-hmm. them, you know, increase probability of being met in the future or with a future partner. And that makes us kind of stop fighting against what we didn't choose Ooh. or what we didn't want. Right. So good. Stop fighting against what we didn't choose. I think that there's so many times that this happens for us and not just in a, in the bedroom and for our sexual life, but it happens in our life. There's things that happen that we didn't choose, but it's important to be able to, like you said, kind of make peace with that part and not allow it to define how we're living our life today. And, and, and you know, it's not our fortune teller. Um, it, it really is just an information point in knowing where we were, right? Absolutely. Our past yeah. is not an all important determiner of our future <laughs> self. We still have complete choice, agency, yeah. and control over how we grow from these moments. Yeah, so beautiful. I, I see a lot of my friends and, you know, I've been married for 12 years. Yeah, 12 years. It'll be 12 years in March. Um, but I, I see a lot of my friends who may be married really young. And I did not marry my first husband till I was 30. So I certainly was not. We were together for 15 years. I guess we started dating when I was 25, but we didn't marry that young. I have a lot of friends that married before 25. And now, sadly, their marriages are ha- have ended. And now they find themselves in midlife starting all over, but um, they definitely are not the same person they were at 21, 22. Maybe this is the first time they have a new partner and maybe their second partner for them. Um, How does someone navigate some of the insecurities that we bring into a relationship later in life? Yeah, I I think awareness is the first stage of any kind of change process. If we're not aware of what belief systems or um, future predictions, negative perspective that we have about ourself, our partner or our relationship, um, we don't know how to create game plans or change processes to better our situation, right? So awareness, and sometimes that just means taking some time, carving time out of your day to reflect on what your intentions are for the choices that you make Mm -hmm. um, and if they're aligned with your desired outcome. Uh, And other times that means seeking out a coach or a therapist to give you some important feedback that maybe you just, you have a different perspective and you're not able to see on your own. So, so good. So good. I think that a lot of times, and this is really what a coach or a therapist does for us, right? They really are able to reflect to us some of the things that at times we may not um, be able to see a hundred percent, or maybe we see, but we're not sure how to get past that to the next level, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, The awareness was really important. And if we're finding ourselves, everybody has a bit of a magic number for like how Mm -hmm. they measure and assess the satisfaction or functionality Mm -hmm. of their relationship, right? If we, if we take it from like a ratio perspective, a lot of people are like, yeah, if it's 70% good and 30% not great, you know, like we have Mm -hmm. tips or bigger and we need to repair those moments 30% of the time. Um, when we look into like research of attunement, 70%, if you are attuning and connecting and accurate with your evaluation of what your partner feels and what they need in that moment, 70% of the time, your, your attachment is secure. You are good to go. You feel fulfilled and connected intimately. We start to drop down below that number. Um, Mm -hmm. we start to feel it. We feel that disconnect. We feel moments of loneliness when we're not alone. Mm -hmm. And I think those are indicators for us to be like, okay, what what am I bringing into the dynamic that is disrupting our ability to connect or communicate? And what do I feel like my partner is bringing in? Are these our issues or are these, you know, preceding our relationship? Are these prior to our relationship? Mm -hmm. 
and things that we're needing to work out and heal together. Mm. Um, I love healing together. I think that, um, you know, in my relationship with my husband as well, um, you know, we, we, he also had a past relationship and some of the pain from that broken marriage also were um, the things that he carried here. And we made an intentional decision to really heal together from our stories. We were 100% honest or where we came from. And and that was one of the things that I think makes us a strong couple. And by the way, we're not a super couple. We don't have it all together. I don't want the listeners to think that no, we're like, does. you know, <laughs> oh my gosh, we're the paragon of perfection. Because certainly, you know, uh, I can tell you, Mr. Daniel Collins leaves his shoes and laundry all all over and I have to manage my brain and be like, I still love him, even though his laundry is in the way here, you know, yeah. <laughs> that sort of thing. But you talked a little bit about, um, you know, being aware and, and again, awareness is, is, is incredibly important. You also talked about that, you know, when we start to fall below a certain threshold, what are some of the signs that were, because I think that we live by default, so mm -hmm. many times we automate so many different things in our life and that um, we we fall below, right, that that threshold at times and we may not realize. And, you know, what, what are some of the signs that kind of are pointing at that we're going down, you know, maybe not the road that we want to be down? What are some of the things that we should look at either as an individual in in a relationship or dating or even in, in, a, in a committed relationship? Yeah, absolutely. There are so many. And some of them are unique and subjective to the dynamics that are um, in front of me, right? And that's why every treatment plan should be deeply personalized to every couple, um, because everyone's different. Yeah, I think some of the, <clears throat> the overlapping characters or, or concepts that we see as recurring themes in these moments of like threshold um, lowering is is intolerance, right? Mm -hmm. In the beginning of a relationship when things are feeling new and fresh and exciting and connected and we don't have so much history uh, of like intensity or, or pain at times, mm -hmm. our tolerance levels are supreme, right? Like our partner yeah. can shake their foot under the dinner table incessantly for weeks and it not bother us at all. Sometimes we think it's adorable. <laughs> 5, 10, 15, 20 years into the marriage, our tolerance levels start to drop. <laughs> we find that we are experiencing miscommunication and we're feeling misunderstood by mm. each other pretty regularly. And we find yeah. some emotional reactivity present, which means um, when we reflect on like the the situation at hand, the emotional response to that situation doesn't seem warranted. And oftentimes that's because we are globalizing these recurring themes in the relationship rather than looking at these moments as singular moments of misattunement, right? Misattunement. So I love that word. <laughs> well, yeah. So when we like look at the past and we start bringing in all of these like evidence or mm -hmm. um, examples of how we feel unappreciated, right? It's never about the dishes. It's always about something deeper. Mm. So I feel unseen. I feel unvalued. I feel um, unlovable or like this, this relationship is hopeless in its ability to meet my needs or get better, right? Like there's mm -hmm. these underlying currents of deepened meaning that get glommed onto past moments. And when we globalize things like that, rather than just see these experiences as singular <laughs> experiences, we experience emotional overreactivity, right? Wow. Yeah. I, I have to say, you said something that really um, messed with my brain. Uh, you said it's never about the dishes, but I really want to believe it's about the dishes at times. You know, I, we, and, and I, um, I know that this is probably a scratch the surface tool, and I am I am big into um, personality, et cetera. So I've we've taken the love languages quiz. We've done the disc assessment. I know my enneagram to my husband's dismay. I take the test. I make him take it. And then I'm thinking, oh, well, because I'm on the D, which is the dominant personality on the disc, and he is a supportive. I get it. This is you know the way that I would have interpreted that assessment for a coworker, right? That's what I try to bring in. Maybe as the coach in me, and he's always telling me I'm not I'm not his coach, and he reminds 
reminds me of that all the time. Um, and I have to kind of sit back. But I, a lot of times I do feel it's about the dishes. Like, are you kidding me? Like, dude, I'm working just as much as you. Do the dishes. Put them in the dishwasher. That's going to go a long way for me to be in the mood in the bedroom, right? Um, is, is there a level of that being the truth as well? It definitely, yeah. I think what we feel is unmet in the relationship as a whole in different domains absolutely impact yeah. our openness and receptivity to sexual intimacy or physical intimacy, especially for mm-hmm. women, because women more so than men tend to mm, mesh intimacy mm-hmm. and sex, right? Yeah. So when that happens, when intimacy and sex are the same thing for us conceptually, we we often need a foundation of intimacy to be present, mm-hmm. right? First. Yeah. And yeah. for a lot of men or for more analytical thinkers, women included, uh, they are two separate things, right? Sex right. and intimacy are two experiences that you can have entirely exclusive from one another. And so you don't need that foundation necessarily to be interested. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's usually a source of conflict between partners if they're different in how they conceptualize those two things. Yeah. I think going back to the dishes example, what I heard from you was I work full time too. I contribute <laughs> a lot to this relationship. Please do the dishes. Yeah. Um, what what I hear behind that is two things. I want to be seen for the amount of contribution and energy I gift to this relationship. And also, I require equality and fairness for me yeah. to feel fulfilled in this relationship. And if I feel like I'm contributing more mm-hmm. on a regular basis than you are, I don't feel like I have an equal partner and that's a problem, right? Yeah. You know, it's it's so funny as you're saying that um, I'm hearing Brene Brown in the in the background saying, right, they were not 50-50 and that some days we all have to be uh, more in than the other partner. And, and, and I know that at times it's like, I don't want to have that equal part in theory. I don't want to have the, the equal partner, but in practical, it's like, dude, come on. You know, and I think that I'm not the only one. These are the these are the conversations that many of my girlfriends and I have. Right? Um, yeah. How come they don't do this? Uh, we we actually had a girls' weekend at my friend's boat, so if she's listening, she'll know. Um, <laughs> but you know, again, we're going to protect the 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 innocent here. Um, but that was the conversation with many of the women that were there because we, we were a few of us girls, and we just can't imagine like uh, why is it hard to to like close in the hamper or take the trash. Like, why do I have to ask you for the trash? Right. Why? And that, and like, dude, that's the thing that you do. And now mind you, I could take the garbage out too. Right. But why do we create these rules and, and, uh, and, and how can we go back to Brene Brown, give in more than our share without feeling like we got, we got the short end of the stick because we're giving more. How can we be selfless in the relationship when we're not feeling like it? And that that may not even be an answer you can give, right? But I I, I love your take on that. I have a couple of responses to it. Good, good. One, I think it's, I think it's very real that our society in particular still has a double shift for, or sometimes a triple shift for women Mm -hmm. in hetero relationships, right? So I don't want to discount that being an active variable here. Mm -hmm. I think there is an expectation still as like a, you know, a, a, this is a cultural shift that we're needing, Um, but there's still an expectation for women to financially contribute, do the predominant care um, for children or pets and manage the household and social engagements. And Mm -hmm. that is so taxing and so overwhelming. There's so much mental load that is invisible and oftentimes unrecognized by their counterparts. Um, And that oftentimes is what is like the tipping point or the straw, that final straw for women to feel unseen or like their dynamic is unfair. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I think that's really important is to bring in like the mental load, the invisible labor that we are still oftentimes expected to, to take on, but it's just as much taxing as like taking out the trash. Right. Yeah. So that's one piece Um, in terms of evaluating contribution and equality within that contribution. 
it's important to do formal contracting with your partners because contributions look so different from person to person, right? right. It's it the emotional contributions. There are eight forms of intimacy. So it can, it can present in so many different ways. It does not mean I'll vacuum the house on Tuesdays and you'll vacuum the house on Thursdays, right? right? So like equality really demands openness and transparency of role choice mm-hmm. for the for each partner so that everybody is known and and um accepting of what those roles are what that division yeah. of labor and responsibility is to make that relationship function long term mm. so now you mentioned eight different um forms of intimacy did i get that right yeah yeah oh my goodness okay can you give us a quick glimpse at what those are Yes, we have creative, social, sexual, physical, um, emotional, experiential, and then we have uh, psychological. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that this is, um, and again, I'm measuring all of this based on my experience. And I think, you know, there's so many different ways in which definitely my husband and I connect in so many different ways in this relationship, right? Um, we have um, that connection, not only in the bedroom, but we also have that connection when we may be out, out in the world together. Those little inside jokes that we have as a, as a couple, or sometimes we'll be sitting and we'll just holding hands and um, all of these things, I think. Think, um, are things that we take for granted. And I think in my past relationship, there were so many different things and there were some great things, but there were so many different things that we didn't have that level of intimacy because for whatever reason, right? Um, how do couples, I, I, I have two questions and I think that this is the other thing that I I believe many of the listeners may be wondering. Number one is how do couples that had betrayal be a part of their marriage or, or their experience? How do, how do they come back? Because I know that I know a couple that has come back from that. And, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of work and therapy and commitment, forgiveness that has gone into the process, but it is possible, correct, to come back? And what are some of the ways in which a couple can come back from that? Yeah, absolutely. So betrayal repair, and there are so many different forms of betrayal, right? Like mm-hmm. it's uh, usually infidelity is is the catalyst for coming right. to therapy but it's it's oftentimes not the first betrayal that's been in the relationship mm-hmm. um so the way that we kind of cushion or brace our relationships to manage these moments because we're human mm-hmm. we're imperfect we're going to mess up and that makes our relationships naturally imperfect we don't want to assume that to be in a healthy relationships and a healthy relationship means absolute absence of conflict that is not possible, right? right? So what we prioritize is a really effective, efficient, reparative process, mm-hmm. right? Being able to come together, sit down in a vulnerable way, provide each other safe space to be seen and hear what has happened, what led up to this decision, mm-hmm. why did this happen, right? Yeah. So we can come together and collaboratively evaluate what changes to make in the system to prevent the recurrence in the future, right? Mm -hmm. Our brain won't allow us to release, let go, forgive something that is actively injuring us, right? So if Mm -hmm. a, if a betrayal is mm, coalitions against your partner, right? If me and my partner are arguing and I bring Mm -hmm. my sister into the mix and it imbalances the hierarchy. And now I feel um, my partner feels unseen or unsupported, right? Mm -hmm. If the coalition is a recurring issue and that's a betrayal experience for my partner, the way to move forward is one, provide the validation, two, identify why this happens in the first place, the dynamic or or the patterns, right? Mm -hmm. And then collaboratively come together to disrupt those patterns moving forward. We need the behavioral change in order to feel safe again to step into that place of vulnerability. And there has to be a choice, right? Forgiveness or trust right. rebuilding. Right. The formula is super simple, but really difficult to like manifest, right? So the formula for trust rebuilding is verbal promises made with mm-hmm. observable actions congruent with them. And then the choice to let go and move forward, step into that vulnerable space again. Without seeing those two things over time be congruent, we don't have any reason to choose 
vulnerability again, right? Mm. So I think yeah. there's like a whole protocol and process for betrayal repair, but as long as both or all parties are committed and interested in reconnecting in that way and healing, because it does take energy and effort <laughs> to do so, as long as everybody's in it, it's definitely resolvable. It's repairable. Yeah. I think that, that, you know, there's such beauty in repairing um, a relationship because there's so many different things that can happen that can lead to something like that. And I, you know, I, I saw it with uh, my parents, my parents divorced, but um, I think that there were a lot of different things that are possible when you decide that you're committed to the process, committed to yourself. Um, you know, you can forgive without being disrespectful of yourself, your values, et cetera. Uh, I mean, I can, talk about this all day. The the interesting part that I have seen um, in some of the interaction of couples that have perhaps worked through a betrayal is that one or, or one partner um, maybe will bring back the betrayal. How do they get past that? If if it's something that, you know, oh, you did that or, or, or is that someone who is maybe, you know, not has their own insecurities and they're hanging on to the betrayal because of their own insecurities or, or is that something that maybe they just didn't really process the betrayal and get past it? Why? So this, and, is, this is when the betrayal yeah. ends and somebody yep. keeps bringing the topic yep. back up. Yeah. Okay. Cause I've seen this a lot in, 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 you know, again, I don't want to call anybody, but I see this in, in conversations that I've had with, you know, individuals that I come in contact with, or even on TV as well. <laughs> I've been watching suits and it made me kind of go into, and I don't know if anybody else is watching suits, but that made me kind of think of that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, typically what that tells us, uh, if it's being brought up in a way that, because there's a there's a healthy and an unhealthy way of gotcha. like rediscussing old topics. Mm -hmm. So in what should what can be normalized check-ins within the relationship, whether that be once a month or once a year, mm -hmm. um, there should be a, a predetermined list of like topics or measurable questions that partners kind of bounce back and forth to evaluate mm -hmm. the health of their relationship, right? Yeah. Um, so if you're bringing up one of these past wounds or pain moments as a way to check in, right, after we've repaired to just to be like, hey, mm -hmm. do we feel like we're still stable in the game plan that we created to ensure that this doesn't happen again? Are you feeling urges to do anything mm -hmm. in particular? Am I feeling like my intuition, my spidey senses are on fire and I'm now feeling hypersensitive to whatever you're doing? These are cues that we need to jump back into intimacy reconnection, vulnerable and emotion focused dialoguing, and maybe even some solution focused like strategy for how we prevent this recurrence of betrayal and also strengthen our bond because our, our bond's mm. a little shaky at this point if I'm asking those questions. Yeah. And then there's the unhealthy way, which is um, bringing them up in the context of like snarky, snide mm. or contemptuous remarks. Right, right. Right. Those are expressions of um, like active wounding, right? That mm -hmm. that tells us that somebody has not truly moved forward from. Um, and there there are a lot of ways in which that may be the case, right? Like I think it depends on the person's history, right. and um, sometimes on like the presence of anxiety or depression, mood state shifting can really mm -hmm. impact our ability to let something go or to hyperfixate and ruminate on on something. So I think there could be many ways in which why why somebody is struggling to let go of something that is past oriented. We just have to dig down and figure out why. Why is it still? palpable yeah. why is it still like this external entity interrupting your relationship right that's such a great answer you know i, I again i'm picturing suits here and i'm thinking <laughs> hmm, the interaction of people and when and, and, and i am such a um 
I don't know if, if it's if it's common to other coaches, but now, you know, I I hear dialogue in TV shows uh, since becoming a coach in 2017, so many different things like, oh, they're saying that they hurt me, but they can't hurt you. It's not anyway, that's just my own little brain going everywhere. Um, the other topic I want to bring up because I, I it would be a disservice to you. And uh, but I really want to kind of dig a little deeper into this as well. You you work with couples and you know for many with many different backgrounds but there may be in in relationships with not just one partner um <laughs> what should be one thing that the person that maybe is not familiar with individuals that have alternative lifestyles they should know i i i'm a big proponent that you know we we need to be more honest about what other people live like so that we don't discriminate or don't look at the them and us, you know, we're othering, right? A lot of people because it's unfamiliar to us. I'd love to really be able to kind of um, learn from you. What should we know? Um, obviously, that may not be any everybody's lifestyle, but it is the lifestyle that some people choose for themselves. And what what is a good way for us to identify a little bit more with them? Yeah, um, perfect question. So ethical non-monogamy, when we look at the research by report, is one out of every five U.S. relationships. Wow, I didn't realize that. That's pretty high. And that's by report because this is like still a very taboo yeah. process and, and subject. So we know that the rates are probably higher than that ratio. Um, so one, I, I think that statistic is important because it helps us normalize it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That if you if you have more than five friends, one of those friends will have jumped into some kind of ethical non-monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking about it from that perspective, like how would I respond to my friend if this is the structure that allows them the most happiness and that mm. it's back in life and within their relationships. So yeah. tapping into that like normalcy and empathy within your own system helps us connect with whoever's in front of us. Yeah. And then I think uh, also diving into the research on <laughs> uh, from like a from a systemic perspective, how dynamics interact in ethical non ethical non-monogamy. Um, we know that each dyadic structure, which is each two-person structure, operates fairly independently from however many people, persons may be in the mm -hmm. polycule itself, right? Yeah. If it's a six-person polycule, each of those two-person dynamics have their own relationship with one another. Mm. It's not just a mushing together of six different people, right. right? And I think what's a little overwhelming for a lot of coaches and providers to start working with these communities is the complexity of these yeah. systems. They're not odd, strange, or really that globally different from monogamous structures. They're just much more complex because they involve um, a lot of contracting, a lot of like logistics planning, because you're managing many people's schedules simultaneously to ensure fairness. And, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I think that usually helps people feel like, okay, I, I can do this. I'm trained and I'm competent to work with one uh, with two partners who interact with one another. And it's not so different. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm i thinking back and as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking back again. I, I'm, you know, people were going to think I watch a lot of television, but if you listen to the show often, you know that I, I don't watch a lot of television. Maybe I did in a past life, but I used to watch Big Love and I was so intrigued by the idea of um, I guess the main character having multiple wives, right? And this is before the the other show, the the reality show came out with the mm -hmm. sister wives. Um, but I was so intrigued that he had such a different relationship with each of the wives, mm -hmm. and that the interaction in the way that he needed each of them was so different. Um, and they filled a different need for him. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, um, and this may be a controversial question, but I guess I, as my brain kind of works through this answer based on, on what you just said, is it possible that all of us could be in multiple relationships at one? Because, you know, obviously one person, and I am incredibly committed to my husband, I am not looking to be in multiple relationships. And I don't think he is either, but I'm wondering, could all of us be capable of having these multiple um, relationships because different relationships can fill different voids for us. 
Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're all absolutely capable. I think what blocks a lot of people um, are the philosophies of what (laughs) love, commitment, loyalty, marriage, right? Like these are definitions that still have heavy backing from Mm -hmm. like religious belief systems or even older, like puritanical um, structures or expectations Mm -hmm. about sex. And you know what I mean? So I think it depends on your definition and if Mm -hmm. your definitions change or evolve or expand your openness to other structures or other experiences of love opens as well. How important and, um, Maybe, you know, again, this is another, this theoretical questions, how important is being able to talk about this at an early age? And, you know, we live in a society right now that uh, in many areas, they're really censoring education, information, being, you know, again, for a puritanical um, perspective that may not necessarily fit into everyone. Um, You know, everybody has a different definition of morality, but how important is it for us to have open and honest conversations? And why should we um, be able to create um, instances of openness for these conversations? Yeah, I think the education piece is largely Mm -hmm. what's missing for both relational and emotional intelligence in like core curriculum for public education, but also just our general Mm -hmm. society. We don't talk about these things often, critical, critical life skills Mm -hmm. in order to have successful and healthy relationships. Um, So I think having these conversations early on is really, really important. What we're empowering is choice and freedom for people to participate in whatever expression of love Mm -hmm. helps them feel seen, appreciated, connected. And for some people, having a philosophy of openness and Mm multi-love does not mean that they're going to be engaging in an open relationship or in polyamory, right? Some people just like, yeah, I I found a person that I love and I'm deeply committed to. And also I'm tired and my other primary person is going to be me, not somebody else. Amazing. Yeah. And I think that's totally healthy. And I think that a lot of people don't realize. And I think that for me, at least, um, I am the better partner for Dan when I am in a great place for myself. Mm-hmm. And not only a better partner, but also a better daughter, a better friend, a better coach. And and for many of us, we forget about that relationship that we can have. You know, I could talk to you for days. I think you can be our resident expert in this topic. <laughs> it's been so amazing. You hold retreats. Tell me a little bit about that. What are those retreats about? We do. Yeah, we host a Hawaiian in-person, all-inclusive couples retreats here on mm-hmm. the island. Um, we have a little farm that we are on, about an Ooh, acre so fruit tree. I know. Fruit trees and herbs. And um, it's about four hours of therapeutic workshops that are personalized to you in the morning. And then we do really, really fun excursions in the evening. Um, So it's a blast. We all have a great time. And it's like six months to a year of couples therapy smushed into one weekend. That feels like a vacation at the end. Amazing. Amazing. So who should be looking at maybe attending this retreat? Because I would imagine it's not just the couple that maybe is experiencing some challenges. This could be any couple, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Or multi, multi-partner multi couples. Absolutely. Multi-partner. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. Anyone who is identifying as like, our relationship feels like roommates, we seem mm-hmm. to have lost our fizzle, or we're actively trying to repair resentment that is no longer present, but the emotional response to it is present. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. I have learned so much. This has been an incredible conversation. As always, I love having guests that are just um, know their stuff and really are creating an impact on the lives of others through the work that they do. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here, Dr. Stephanie. It's been so good to have you and get to know you better. Will you come back again? Absolutely. I had so much fun talking with you and we could dive into so many other topics. Oh, please. My brain is going 100 million miles per minute now. I'm like, oh, we could talk about this. We could talk about that. And maybe we'll take some some client questions and kind of deep dive into that. That would be kind of really fun. So we'll talk offline. Um, I want everybody to please make sure that you connect to Dr. Stephanie Bathworth 
Um, let her know, number one, that you found her through Costa Confidence and that you um, are really loving her stuff. She's got the flow formula. She's got a quiz on her website. She's got all of the outline of her services, how to schedule time with her. She has the information on the retreats and that is Bathurst. Oh, did I say that right? I'm wrong. I'm, you know, I knew it. Sorry. Um, I'm going to spell it. B-A-T-H-U-R-S tfamilytherapy.com. And we're going to put this in the show notes. So make sure that you let her know you found her here, follow her on all the social media platforms and make sure that you um, prevent yourself from being hacked like I was and change your passwords, people. (laughs) So (laughs) noted. Don't forget, go confidently in the direction of your dreams, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Casa de Confidence. We thank you for listening. And if you want more, go to CasaDeConfidencePod.com. Check Julie out on her socials as Julie DeLuca Collins. And you can also check out her website at GoConfidentlyCoaching.com. Have a great week. And don't forget, go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Hi, everybody. I know that sometimes we get very lonely in this entrepreneur journey, and I want to invite you to join us into our limited time only Purposeful You Mastermind. For many of us entrepreneurs, we believe that we can do it all, but the reality is that doing it alone only creates a lot of overwhelm. So join us at the Purposeful You Mastermind. You can find out more information by going to bit.ly forward slash Julie's mastermind. This is going to be the place where you are able to then unlock your full potential and achieve long-term success for your business, push you behind your current limits, expand your connections, discover new ideas, and implement them with confidence. You're going to get the support in all aspects and transforming you to the six-figure business you've been looking for. Pause and get off the hamster wheel if you've been spinning around. This is a time where you can get that support from like-minded entrepreneurs that are here to join you in your journey. Together, we can challenge the assumptions and land the speaking engagements and opportunities we want to grow our business and make an impact in the lives of people. See you then. Remember, you can find the mastermind at bit.ly, Julie's Mastermind.